it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Ian Anderson, who will give lecture three of his series on symmetries, conservation laws, and variation principles. Okay, Go thank ahead. you very much, Dennis, and thanks to everyone who's here today and has, has managed to hang in there for, for these three lectures. Uh, so let me begin with a, a short review. In, in lecture number one, we talked about symmetries. We have a system of differential equations, which we denote symbolically by delta equals zero. We define the, the formal linearization of those equations. And then we said that the uh, defining a system of equations for a generalized conservation law, conservation law being a collection of functions depending upon the independent dependent variables and their derivatives, they have to satisfy this uh, formal linearization equation uh, L sub delta of rho equals zero. For conservation laws, we talked about that in the second lecture. We started with a system of equations. The adjoint of the linearization equation appears and a necessary condition for a set of functions rho to be the characteristics for, for a symmetry or I'll just say to generate our symmetry is that the adjoint equation uh, the row satisfies the adjoint equation, but we have made very clear through a simple example that this condition was not enough to generate symmetry. There are additional conditions. In the talk, last talk, we generalized this adjoint equation uh, for uh, lower order, lower degree conservation laws. So for conservation laws of degree, less than n minus one, where n was the dimension of the base manifold. And we found lots of interesting examples of lower degree conservation laws for Maxwell's equations, for uh, um, Einstein equations in asymptotically flat regions, and so on. So today I wanna to focus a little bit on, on Noether's theorem. Noether's theorem zero. So I've got many versions of this. And the first version is follows immediately from what we've got on, on our slide already. If uh, VI is a conservation law, then there is an equivalent conservation law with the divergence of VI tilde equals rho alpha delta alpha. And that implies that, that li adjoint linearization equation holds. And now if the linearization equation is self-adjoint, then that implies that L delta of rho equals zero. And that implies there's a symmetry, you have a symmetry. And throughout the lecture today, we'll use this condition or some var variations of it. These are the Helmholtz conditions. And we'll say that an operator is uh, locally closed, variationally closed or locally variational if this condition holds. It's always satisfied if delta is a, <clears throat> or a Lagrange operator. And so we get this first version uh, of Noether's theorem. And what we're going to do today is sharpen this zeroth order version up. Uh, we're going to need, in order to do that, we're going to need a, a, a lemma. And the lemma says the following. Suppose you have, suppose you have a function just on the base space, then a function on jet space, and suppose that, um, and suppose that uh, the Euler-Lagrange expression of this product is equal to zero. So f times g, calculate the Euler-Lagrange of that. And suppose this is equal to zero for all f. Then g is in fact a only a function of the independent variables x. And the proof of this is pretty easy. We in lecture number two, we had the product rule for the Euler-Lagrange operator. And 
if we use that product rule in this particular setting, it becomes the total derivatives of F times the Euler operators of G equals zero. And since F is completely arbitrary, it's not too hard to argue that that implies all the Euler operators of G is equal to zero. And from that is easy to check that uh, G is a function only of the dependent variables. In fact, if we did a little bit more, if we let, if we let F be a function of X and U, arbitrary, then we would actually get the G has to be zero. Okay. I want to stress that in order for this theorem to be true, this function has to be a function of all the independent variables, not just some of them. So for example, if we were in dimension two with independent variables X and Y, and we have this expression, F of X times some total derivative of some function g tilde, then I can just pull this uh, total derivative out, put it on the whole pair because this is not, this is independent of y and rewrite this equation this way. And so, uh, but the Euler-Lagrange expression of any total derivative is zero. So this is identically zero. So from this equation, which is similar to this one right here, the only difference being that this is only a function of one of the, um, independent variables. Uh, from th in this case here, you don't, you're not allowed to get any conclusions. And this is very, this is like a formal jet space version of what sometimes called sort of the fundamental lemma in the calculus of variations. Namely, if you integrate, if you integrate a function of x times some function, some other function of x, over a manifold, over some open sets. If this is equal to zero for all f, then g is equal to zero. <clears throat> and uh, the way this usually goes is if g is not zero, you pick a point where it's positive, and then you build a, a bump function around that point, and you can get the calculation from, from that. But again, this sort of fundamental lemma of the calculus variations requires that this test function be a function of all the variables. And now this will come up as we, as we talk about Noether's uh, second and third theorems. Another topic that we need to briefly discuss by way of background is the idea of a natural operator. So a natural operator is some operator, I'm going to think of it as a differential operator, maybe a linear differential operator, but uh, a natural operator is an operator from the tensor spaces, ten some tensors of type RS to tensors of type PQ, which, inter which is an intertwining operator for any local diffeomorphism. So if you have a diffeomorphism from M to M, then apply that diffeomorphism to a tensor, apply that to the operator D, that's the same as applying the tensor to the operator D and then taking the pullback or push forward by that diffeomorphism. And the infinitesimal version of that, which is what one usually uses, uses to check, would be that the Lie derivative of that operator commutes. Uh, the Lie de uh, derivative uh, with respect to a vector field X commutes with this operator. Well, we all know our favorite examples of natural differential operators. Uh, Maybe the most famous one is the exterior derivative operator mapping R forms to R plus one forms. Uh, in a paper, very nice paper by Richard Pillay, it was studied natural operations on differential forms. And uh, to nobody's real surprise, I and this was in a very general setting. He, he didn't just restrict to linear differential operators. Yeah, uh, so he studied natural operators between differential forms, and he proved that if you're going from R forms to R plus one forms, um, D was the only operator you could write down. And if you went from R forms to R plus two forms, then there were no natural operators. And so that's a, uh, some kind of weird proof that D squared is equal to zero, because there are no natural operators, which increase degree by two. This topic of natural operators will be important to us for a full understanding of, of the Noether's theorem. 
Okay, so the next step now is to introduce the review of the variational bicomplex for just a minute. So we start off with our, our fiber bundle E over M. On top of E, we build the jet spaces. On, on the infinite jet space, we, we uh, write down uh, the exterior algebra of differential forms, and that splits into forms of horizontal and vertical degree. And the exterior derivative then splits into a, into a vertical derivative and a horizontal derivative. And just to remind you how that picture goes, the zero, zero, these ones here are the functions. Uh, if n is equal, if our base manifold is dimension three, then the forms in here look like some function on jet space, dx, dy, dz. So this is the space of Lagrangians. And when we were talking about conservational, classical conservation laws, they were living down there. And then this would be our space of lower degree conservation laws. So when in this diagram I've written, uh, the first index refers to the number of dx's, the number of horizontal differentials, and the second index refers to the, the contact degree. So we'll also be working today in this space. So omega v1, those are the forms that look like dx, dy, dz, times some contact one form, of particular importance to us will be the ones that involve only the lowest order contact form. So that's D U alpha minus U alpha I minus U D U alpha minus U alpha I D X I. And this has a special name that gets attached to it. Forms that look like this, where these are functions on jet space, these are called source forms. Okay, so uh, lots of fun things to do now. Uh, you can develop the entire variational calculus. Uh, and by the variational calculus, I mean you take all the usual formulas from dif differential geometry or, or calculus on manifolds. That is to say, all the forms for involving brackets, the exterior derivative, and the lead derivative. Take all these forms, formulas, and there's maybe two dozen of them. Like you can, you can, you can, a dozen or so you can write up, write down immediately, and generalize. See how all these for, formulas generalize to the case of jet spaces, and that, and the prolongation of, of vector fields. So back in the first lecture, we said if you have a vector field, then uh, on E, and I'm going to restrict to the simplest case of a projectable vector field, then that vector field can be prolonged up to the jet space, and it can be decomposed into two pieces, the to a total vector field and evolutionary vector field. And I think I changed my notation and started writing x tote. x tote, the total vector fields are of this form. AI DI, where this is the total derivative operator, and XEV uh, are vector fields which are vertical and then prolonged up to the infinite jet space. And using the fact that the total vector fields hook with the contact form to zero and that um, the lead derivative um, of a vector field preserves the contact ideal, or more precisely, it actually preserves the forms of different bigrading, then you can develop this, what I call a variational calculus, which is just kind of all the identities you can write down involving brackets, uh, prolongation, exterior derivative, and so on. And so here's a, a very well-known one that the prolongate, the bracket of two prolonged vector fields is the same as the prolongation of the bracket. If we have a total vector field and a vertical vector field, an evolutionary vector field, and this is just a vector field coming from, from the base, then that bracket is zero. A dh squared and dv squared are zero. And, and what will be important for us right now is 
that the uh, standard lead derivative formula, the Carton formula for, for the lead, uh, lead derivative of, of form, we get that in two flavors. We get the lead derivative of a horizontal type vector, so that's the lead derivative of x tote, is the usual Carton formula involving only the horizontal part of the exterior derivative. And the lead derivative of the vertical, with respect to a vertical part, only involves the vertical exterior derivative. And from that, you get a very important formula that if X is an evolutionary vector field, then you can pass the, um, you can pass the, the hook or the interior product through the vertical derivative. So this is a good set of formulas to have, and it's ideally suited, and these formulas are ideally suited for the task at hand, namely to study symmetries and conservation laws. So here we go. So what I want to do is I want to take a Lagrangian. That's a top, the horizontal top dimensional form. And I want to calculate its lead derivative. We'll take a minute and go through this slowly. <clears throat> so, we know that we can take this prolongation vector field and split it into its a total and an evolutionary part. So that's what I've done here. I've written the lead derivative of lambda as the lead derivative of the total part and the lead derivative of the horizontal part. Let's have a look at this. Well, by our Carton formula in the variation of bicomplex, we have that the lead derivative of the total vector is the total hook the horizontal derivative plus the horizontal derivative hook the total vector field. But uh, the horizontal derivative increases the horizontal degree by one, and we're already at top horizontal degree. So this term is equal to zero. This has n plus one horizontal degree. So we're just down to this. Now for the second part term, a little trickier. Let's work on this term now. So the lead derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to evolutionary vector field, well, by our Carton formula, that's the, um, that's hook dv plus dv hook. Now, this vector field looks like partial u and stuff involving, after prolongation, stuff involving higher order derivatives. But this is a horizontal form, so this time this goes away. And we're left with just xev hook dv of lambda. But now we have to recall, pull something out of, the, out of our hat, we have to recall that the vertical derivative, this vertical exterior derivative, is really just a field variation. And if you think of this, um, vertical derivative is just kind of a variation in your dependent variables, then perhaps it's no surprise that this becomes the Euler Lagrange operator of lambda plus a boundary term dh eta, where e alpha of lambda is um, the Euler Lagrange operator of lambda times d theta alpha wedge dx1. So this is the Euler Lagrange operator. And notice this Euler Lagrange operator is a source form. Aha. Okay. Uh -huh. So now let's put these two pieces together. From the horizontal, oh, so let's put this into this formula. Uh, XEV hook DV becomes XEV hook the Euler operator plus an exterior derivative, horizontal exterior derivative. So we get X EV hook the Euler operator plus, and now we can run this XEV through DH and we end up with this formula right here. That the lead derivative of the Lagrangian is the evolutionary part of the vector field hook the Euler Lagrange operator plus the total derivative of this. Where does this thing live? Well, this is a N minus one zero form. And that then, that then is essentially the proof of what we're going to call Noether's theorem number, whoop, 
that's that's essentially then an easy proof from the variational calculus, coordinate free without any hard calculations of uh, the first version of Noether's theorem. So if x is a symmetry of lambda, then that means that the lead derivative with respect to the propagation of lambda is zero, then this term is gone. And we see then that um, XEV hook the Euler-Grange operator is a total derivative on solutions of the Euler, you can say this in two ways, on solutions of the Euler-Lagrange equation, this term is zero. And then this right expression right here becomes your conservation law. Or you could say, well, I have a, a, a function that's hooking with the Euler-Lagrange, a vector field hooking, if I write this out, this would be some B rho alpha, delta alpha, this term right here. So I can see that the components of the evolutionary vector are the components of a characteristic it functions for a conservation law. So if we have a symmetry, then this term's gone. And what's left over is our formula for conservation law. So in summary, we just say Noether's theorem is simply uh, a few simple computations in the variational bicomplex and the variational calculus together with this important formula, the first variational formula. So let's ask a simple question. Do global symmetries, so let's, let's just, this X is defined on all of E, so it's a vector field everywhere. Do global symmetries yield global conservation laws? Well, if you go back to the proof, it's going to boil down to, is there a global first there variational formula? So do, does this, for any globally defined Lagrangian, is the vertical derivative an oil Lagrange operator plus an exterior derivative? And as I've said before in other lectures, yes, this formula does hold it in the large, uh, but you have to use, you have, uh, it's be, by virtue of the fact that the interior rows of the variational bicomplex are exact. So it's kind of a non-trivial homological cohomology calculation. The, the answer to this question is yes. But let's refine, refine this a little bit and let's look at natural operators in the variation of Y complex. Well, of course, DH and, and for natural operators, what we're taking here is we're going to take say fiber preserving local diffeomorphisms of E and we'll lift that out and we'll prolong that local diffeomorphism up to uh, up to jet space. And then we'll look for operators which commute with those diffeomorphisms. Well, <clears throat> the two derivative operators, dH and dV are both natural operators. The oil Lagrange operator is a natural operator, although that takes a little bit more work to prove. That is to say, if you pull back your Lagrangian, and compute its Euler-Lagrange expression, that's the same thing as computing the Euler-Lagrange expression and then pulling back. So we can ask, are there, and the Helmholtz operator, which is a map from source forms, well, mapping from uh, n minus one forms. So in our in our bi complex here, drawing the edge of our bi complex, we've got dH here, we've got the Euler Lagrange operator here, we've got the Helmholtz operator here. So there are natural operators going all the way up that edge. But from the point of view of the first variational formula, we can ask the following question. Start with a Lagrangian. Is there a natural operator, and let's just say natural differential operator, mapping you from Lagrangians to n minus one n forms? So that's starting here and ending up 
here. So are there operators from here to here, which are natural and have the property that they, you can plug them into the first variational formula so that for any Lagrangian lambda, this is true where, where your boundary term is given by beta of lambda. Well, the answer is yes, in, but only in special cases. If we're working in mechanics, so there's only one independent variable, one, sorry, yeah, one independent variable, then there's a, such a natural operator. If the order of the Lagrangian is less than or ordered less than or equal to two, then there's such a natural operator. And I, I never think I wrote out a formal proof, but I'm pretty sure that if the order of the Lagrangian is greater or equal to three, then you cannot put a natural operator in, 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 in this place. <clears throat> and so we can apply this to Noether's theorem and say, if we're in the mechanics case or our Lagrangian is of order less than or equal to two, then there's a natural operator taking you from vector fields on E plus Lagrangians to the boundary term. And that natural operator is precisely this one right here. And that's the only possibility. Okay. It's an interesting question uh, to study natural operators on infinite jet spaces. Another example of a natural operator in the calculus of variations goes from in, well, let's go from, let's look at the mechanics case from one zero to a space of all one forms, taking the Lagrangian to the Lagrangian dt minus dl du alpha dot theta alpha. And this is called the Poincaré Cartan form for a uh, <clears throat> Lagrangian in one independent variable. And that's the starting point for um, uh, <clears throat> Hamiltonian formalism in the calculus of variations is the construction of this Poincaré Cartan form. And again, very difficult to write down. I don't think you can write down uh, natural operators, uh, which look which are generalizations of this Poincaré Cartan form. So there's theorem number three is we a bessel hagen it's called bessel hagen symmetry of a Lagrangian, is a vector field which Lee, di Lee differentiates the Lagrangian not to zero, but to some form which is exact. And so if we go back to our, our formula we had, if we go back to our, our formula from our first variational uh, equation, if this is not zero, but it's equal to some total derivative, then I still end up, then I can absorb this total derivative into this expression right here. This is E of lambda. And I'll still have a conservation law. So there's lots to be said about this equation. Uh, symmetries of this kind, but I'm going to leave that as a story for another another time. Okay, here's the next version of Noether's theorem. Start with a source form, so that's a uh, n plus one degree form of this special type, and now repeat the calculations that we did for our Lagrangian. So we calculated before. Lagrangian, but now calculate the Lie derivative of this source form. And again, modeled on the Carton uh, mantra of Lie derivative is D hook something plus hook times D of something. The analog of that formula now becomes that the oil the Lie derivative of our Lagrangian, of our source form, is the oil Lagrange operator hook the evolutionary part of X plus the evolutionary part of X applied to the Helmholtz conditions. So
So here we get a slightly different version of Noether's theorem in which the Lagrangian never appears. Now we say the following. If delta is locally variational, that means h of delta is zero, then this term is gone. If x is a distinguished symmetry of our equations, so a symmetry of delta is a lead derivative, is a, is a symmetry is any vector field, which when prolonged, lead differentiates delta to be zero mod delta. A slightly stronger condition, and the one that shows up in, when you're studying symmetries and conservation laws, is not to require this, is to require more than just this being zero mod delta, is to require that this n plus one form is actually lead differentiating to zero. And so these are called distinguished symmetries of the equations delta equal to zero. They're the symmetries that preserve this form precisely. So let's see, let's go back and, and try this again. Suppose delta is locally variational, then this term is gone. Suppose X is a distinguished symmetry of uh, the source form delta, then this term is gone. And so you're left with X EV hook delta equal to zero. But now we use exactness of the variational bicomplex to conclude at least locally, since the oil Lagrange expression of this Lagrangian is zero, this Lagrangian type object must be the exterior derivative of something. And there's your conservation law right there. So here's how, here's a version of Noether's theorem based not on the lead derivative formula for Lagrangians, but based on the lead derivative formula for source forms, which gives you a way of passing from symmetries to conservation laws without ever having to see a Lagrangian explicitly. And then if uh, the cohomology, if the nth cohomology of my space E is zero, then this is always true. Every, every null Lagrangian is a total derivative. And so X gives you a globally defined conservation law. Okay. And this is somehow, this is somehow the version of Noether's theorem I kind of like the most. I actually worked out some poor man's version of that already many, many years ago. It showed up in my PhD thesis. So I've been thinking about this for a long time. Here's an example. Okay, so let's look at this example. I'm gonna take uh, my manifold to be R3 minus the origin. So cut out the origin. And I'm gonna uh, suppose I have two uh, independent variables and they're both lying on, on the circle. So this is my, my u and v, and here's x, y, and z. So I've ginned this example up. Uh, this space is topologically a torus. So we're sort of looking, sitting here like S2 cross S1 cross S4. So that our, our bundle looks, looks topologically like that, okay? Now consider the following source form. It's the gradient, it's the position vector x, y, z dotted with a gradient of v divided by r cubed. And the second component is negative the gradient of u dotted with a position vector, okay? And now glue all this together and make a source form. Uh, delta one times the, we can, we can just write here du really. I don't get really right here, just dv if we want, because we're wedging in all that stuff. So here's our source form. Uh, very clear that it's, uh, this source form is invariant under the uh, uh, rotation group. So there's a distinguished symmetry. This source form, when Kind of hard to do the calculation by hand, but on the machine, on the computer, it's pretty easy to check that the, this source form is locally variational. The Helmholtz operator on this is zero. And so, and H3 of my uh, space is zero. 
And so by what we just said, this, this generates a global conservation law, and I wrote it down. It's Z over R times essentially the H of U wedge, the H of V. If I write that out in terms of Jacobians, it's like this Jacobian here, dx dy, another Jacobian yz, dy dz, and so on. So there's a global conservation law for this system of equations coming from a global symmetry, even though uh, this form is an obstruction, this form, uh, this source form admits no Lagrangian. So that, that shows you that this second version of Neuther's theorem, where, where there's no mention, where there's no need for an explicit Lagrangian, uh, has some content. There's some real meaning and, app and potential applications for this. Okay, the next one, next version. This time that we're, we're gonna talk about the second version, uh, the second, what's typically called the second Euler's theorem, but we've already got more versions than that. Again, I'm gonna take uh, delta to be locally variational, but now I'm gonna assume uh, that I have an infinite number of symmetries. So I'm gonna write my symmetries as X sub sigma here, sigma are some arbitrary functions, and the symmetries look like some differential operator applied to sigma plus some other differential operator B applied to sigma times the D by DU. Okay, so, and again, I want to emphasize that for this to work, the sigmas have to be functions of all the independent variables. Okay. So if these were differential operators, homogeneous differential operators, and this sigma had compact support, then this would be a symmetry with compact support. So let's go again. So we're going to assume that all these vector fields generate our distinguished symmetries. If I write down the formula for the evolutionary vector field associated to this, these symmetries, it's some differential operator applied to uh, the vertical vectors. And let's see what happens to our formula now. Well, delta being locally variational, box out this. The lead derivative of delta with respect to the vector fields x is zero. So it knocks out this. And I'm left with E times this curly operator, script E applied to delta equals zero. But now I'm going to integrate this by parse and, and shove this operator on the sigmas over onto an operator on the deltas. And so when I do that, this passes over here and becomes the formal adjoint. But now we're at that place where that little lemma that I talked about at, right at the beginning of the talk. The Euler-Lagrange operator applied to, uh, applied to uh, arbitrary functions times some operator on jet space is zero. If this is true for all of these operators, if this is true for all functions sigma, then this must be constant. But generally speaking, this, these operators uh, involve translation and so not only does this have to be constant uh, functions of X, it actually has to be zero. And there's a differential identity on the Euler, the Euler Lagrange operator. So if you have uh, symmetries depending upon arbitrary functions of all the variables, I, I like to call those gauge symmetries, I guess, well, compactly supported, that uh, they can be compactly supported then we get down to these differential identities right here. And that's, uh, I think, a very elegant proof of Neuther's second theorem based upon the Lie derivative formula in the variational bicomplex for a source form. So I've got a couple of examples of this. The most famous one, one that might be familiar to everyone 
is if we're doing some high order mechanics, we have some Lagrangian depending upon uh, uh, dependent variables, U alpha and their time derivatives. And let's suppose that this Lagrangian is parameter invariant. That is to say, if we reparameterize by T, change a different parameter here, then this Lagrangian stays invariant. That corresponds to having X equals sigma of T partial T is a symmetry. The evolutionary vector field for that is minus sigma times u dot alpha d by du. And so from our first, from our formula right away, we get, we get that the Euler Lagrange operator of sigma of t times u dot alpha of t delta alpha is zero. But this is true for arbitrary function sigma. So this must be zero. And there's then, the identity, that's an identity on the components of the Euler-Lagrange operator. And that's a, a standard example of sec Neuler's second theorem. Another example, uh, if we were doing some kind of Maxwell field theory, uh, we would have a Lagrangian. Let me again, let, let me assume there's no explicit X dependence. Uh, here I can think of alpha equals AI the xi, so I could think of this Lagrangian as being a Lagrangian for a one form field theory. Uh, if we assume that this Lagrangian is invariant under gauge transformations, then the evolutionary vector field, let me call that, that's, our, that's my sigma, then the evolutionary vector field, sorry, then the vector field that goes with this symmetry is uh, already in evolutionary form. We apply our formula. We get that the Euler-Lagrange operator of the partial derivative of sigma with respect to x times the Euler operator of this is identically zero. We integrate that by parts and that becomes sigma times of the divergence of the Euler-Lagrange operator is identically zero, but that's true for all sigma. And so the divergence of the, this oil Lagrange operator must be identically zero. Again, to emphasize that you can't just say, well, if, uh, if you have a Lagrangian with a symmetry depending upon the arbitrary function, then you're gonna get differential identities on the oil Lagrange operator. No, it's gotta be an arbitrary function of all the dependent ver independent variables. And here's a standard example, counter example to look at. Here's my Lagrangian. The Euler Lagrange expression delta equals E of L is just the, the wave operator in null coordinates. It's easy to see that, uh, that the wave equation is invariant under translations by, and this should have been, uh, yeah, is, is, is uh, invariant under reparameterizations of X. Here's the evolutionary vector field. And if you plug into our ident plug into our our, our uh, Lie derivative identity, this is what you get: sigma of x times u x times u x y equals zero. But I can rewrite that as the total derivative with respect to y of some expression, and that's already zero. So I get no information. I get no identity out on the Euler Lagrange operator. So you can't just have arbitrary functions of x or arbitrary functions of y. And you might say, well, this should just still generate a conservation law, and it does, and there's the conservation law that it generates. It's not very, it's not particularly interesting to us. And then the final example is, again, let delta be uh, a source form, but this time I'm gonna take my independent variables to be a metric. The signature is not important. So I have some uh, tensor depending upon the metric and its derivatives. We'll assume our symmetry condition is that this is diffeomorph, that this tensor is natural, which means that this is sort of a diffeomorphism invariant formula, which means that really I can rewrite this at, at the A's as functions of the metric 
and the curvature tensor and its covariant derivatives. But again, we're going to assume just that delta is natural and that delta satisfies the Helmholtz conditions and is locally variational. Then immediately from our for formula, we get that the um, divergence of this tensor is zero. So anytime you have a, 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 a tensor which is naturally natural, locally variational, it will automatically be uh, divergence free. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the end of the classical versions of Neuser's theorem. Now we come to this other completely different problem. And in the literature, it's sometimes referred to as the Talkins problem or the general, ge super generalized Neuser's theorem. And the problem goes like this. Suppose now you have a, some um, uh, source form. You have a source form right here. Suppose that uh, you have, uh, and now we have our, our identity, our lead derivative identity. But now I'm going to suppose that we have that these are symmetries. So that term is gone. And now I'm going to suppose that each one of these vector fields generates a conservation law. So that term is gone. And now I'm left with this term equal to zero. So the Helmholtz operator hooked with these evolutionary vector fields is zero. And Talkins problem, named after mathematician Talkins, who wrote for, first to write the paper on this, asks if you have enough symmetries. So if you have enough vector fields, which are distinguished symmetries and ca characteristics, if you have enough, can you infer from these equations that the Helmholtz operator on delta is equal to zero? If you can, then you sort of have a, a beautiful triangle. If you have a variational principle and symmetries, then you have a conservation law. If you have conservation laws and variational pr principles, then you have symmetries. And so the third leg of this stool is if you have symmetries and conservation laws, do you have a variational principle? So this aspect of symmetries, conservation laws, and variational principles says if you have symmetries and conservation laws in this precise sense, do you necessarily have a variational principle? So the original paper on this was by Talkins. And uh, Yuha Poen Pelto and myself picked up on what Talkins did. And we wrote a number of one, two, three, we wrote a number of pa papers on this version of Neuser's theorem. There, there are the quick references to them. And most recently, there was a thesis by. Marcus Dosfinger, I think people, some people in the group know him, will know him. And he also did an excellent job, excellent uh, work on this, this Talkins problem. And I don't want to go too much into the details of the proofs of any of these theorems, but let me, I just want to give two examples of this to show that the Neuser's, this sort of converse to Neuser's theorem or generalized Neuser's theorem by, or Talkins problem, I don't know what you want to call it, can fail in rather interesting ways. So I've got two examples and, and my talk will be done. So the first one is example one. So we're going to consider a source form for a scalar field. So it's du dx1. X, N. So just a scalar, this is a scalar second order PDE. And we're going to assume that there are some symmetries. How many? N of them. So we're, we're N, the number of symmetries equals the dimension of the base space. So we're going to assume there are N distinct symmetries. We're going to assume that these generate 
conservation laws. And we're going to assume that this matrix right here is, is uh, invertible. Okay. And of course, as always, we'll assume that this function is, is smooth. F is smooth. Well, put all this together, this, 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 and this, not too hard to prove. It's a bit of work, but not too hard to prove that delta is necessarily variational. So we would say here that our three that in this setting, we have three equal legs of conservation laws, symmetries, and variational principles. Any two of those conditions will imply the third. But in order to prove this theorem, you have to integrate kind of an Euler's equation, equation for homogeneity. And so uh, that leads to the following uh, sort of surprising counterexample. Here's uh, a source form u over ux to the fourth plus uy to the fourth times the Hessian of u. Uh, it's apparent that this is has partial x and partial y symmetries. It's easy to check, well, it can be checked, that these generate conservation laws. So this is true and this is true. But f is not variational. And so this is one of the sort of weird examples I Weird, a weird example of something that doesn't happen very often in this formal variational calculus business, that the smoothness of f in the neighborhood of the identity, this, is, this function is not smooth, not even defined at the origin. And that's what's failing here is the smoothness is failing. And that's what's leading to this counterexample. So, this has symmetries, this operator has symmetries, conservation laws, but is not variational. <clears throat> and the next example, again, scalar, but now in, in and, and again in, in dimensions, but again, now we're gonna allow, allow for higher order derivatives here. So we could have derivatives of quite high order here. And we're gonna take for our, group of symmetries and conservation laws, uh, the Euclidean group consisting of rotations and translations. <clears throat> and we're going to assume that X has, um, that X has, uh, that X generates symmetries of this. So this equation here is translationally and rotationally invariant. So in particular, there are no the X's don't appear explicitly. And we'll as assume that each one of these symmetries generates a conservation law. And then under the assumption that this is a polynomial in these variables of degree less than or equal to N, then it follows that delta is variational. And if we're you're studying problems in, in the jet calculus involving oil Lagrange operators and symmetries, exactly this kind of thing, then I don't know how well, know, well known this is, but there's a tr Bill Fan tran uh, Dickey transform. It's kind of like a Laplace, sorry, it's kind of like a Fourier transform, but it has the property that changes the Euler Lagrange operator into multiplication, into a multiplication operator. So if you're working with polynomial problems, polynomial objects, and asking questions about the Euler Lagrange operator. This gilfan dickey transform is really uh, terrific. And it, it was the key uh, to, to, to studying the Tawkins problem in this setting. And here's a counterexample. So I'm gonna take my trans n equals two, translations and rotations. And now I'm gonna make this monstrous operator. Script L, I should have I should have called this. I did, oh, I didn't write down what that was. Script L is, is Laplace operator. Okay. So take the Laplacian of U, the Laplacian of the derivative of U, make this, make all these differential polynomials here. And then this thing here is a uh, is a operator value determinant, do a, a column expansion down there. So it's it's um, one times this plus this Laplacian on 
this operator and so on. This thing, if you write it out, I think there's something like a thousand terms in this. It's, pre it's pretty huge. It's of order 10. So it has lots of derivatives in it, but notice that it's cubic in, in it's a polynomial, which is cubic in U and its derivatives. So the degree is three, but I'm working with n equal to two. Well, this thing is manifestly translational and rotationally invariant. Plug it into the computer and you can check that those symmetries generate conservation laws. Plug it into the Helmholtz conditions, they fail. So here's a 10th order uh, polynomial differential operator, which has symmetries and conservation laws, but is not variational. And the proof of this shows in some sense that this is the only example in when in n equals uh, two, or it's the simplest example. So there's a, another failure of this generalized Noether's theorem, but it occurs in a rather spectacular, but it fails in a rather spectacular and high order way. <clears throat> in the two minutes and one minute I have left, let me mention finally, We can we can study we can uh, study uh, tensorial the metric version of this. And we can ask that this is natural. We can require that it be divergence free. And then we can ask, does this imply? that Aij is the variation of the oil Lagrange equations with respect to the variation of some Lagrangian, or we can ask, are the Helmholtz conditions, does A satisfy the Helmholtz conditions? So when N, when the, uh, when, when the number of derivatives is two, this problem was solved by David Lovelock, is my advisor. And the second order uh, tensors in the metric, which are symmetric and divergence free, they're all variational, but they're not. You have things more general than just the Einstein tensor. And so the tensors which satisfy these two conditions uh, lead to something called like Hubbock gravity. So the, the non So, oops, where did we go? Sort of low lock gravity, where you're just going to study these equations. At order three, uh, and then Yuha, Paul and Petzl, we studied this problem and we proved that if the Lagrangian is natural and divergence free, then it satisfies the Helmholtz conditions. But man, I, all I can say was this was, whoops, a big mess of a calculation. It was really a hard, it was really hard to, hard to do. So at orders bigger than three, the problem is open as to whether or not variation, whether or not divergence free and natural implies variational. There's a paper that appeared not too long ago by Stan Dezer, who claims to have solved this problem in complete generality, but I, I don't think what he wrote down is, is a very valid, he has some sort of meta argument, and I, do, I don't think it's a valid, valid proof. Even at orders, even at orders, even at dimension n equals two. So I had a student working on this problem just in the plane. So we have, <clears throat> um, we, can, we can think of, we can think of AIJ as being a function of the metric and just, there's only one curvature component of curvature. So it's just the function of the Riemann, the Riemann scalar curvature and its covariant derivatives, divergence free, and ask if that's variational. And uh, he did this up for order three, so that would be order five in the curvature. 
order five in the metric, I should say, then it worked out that you, you get that it has to be variational. But again, though I thought it might be possible in this two-dimensional case to get a general solution to the problem. But after the enormous amount of work that went into doing just uh, the case where you had the curvature in its first and second derivatives, already that was very difficult uh, to do. So just gives you some idea how, how, how difficult this Talkins problem is in this, in this special case. I think that's a good place for me to, to end my, my series of lectures. I'd like to thank everybody who, for, for participating. It's been a real pleasure to, for me to give these talks. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much for that excellent series. Um, are there any questions for Ian? Um, yes. Uh, so uh, Ian, uh, you, you had your first counterexample. Uh, uh, for, for, for rationality, there was u divided by ux power four, u ui power four. Uh, let's see this one. Yeah, this one right here. Uh, Much this yeah. one. This one. Yeah. Yes. All right. So so uh, and uh, and you were checking this operator to be variational, but in principle. Can you just drop this factor, this first order factor, before we? Um, sure, you, sure. You could drop this factor, but then uh, um, you could drop the factor. But now you've upped the problem to another level. So now you're assuming you're, you're looking maybe at this. If you have symmetries plus conservation laws. Does that imply there exists a multiplier mm -hmm. such that when you multiply by the source form, you get a new source form, which is Euler Lagrange? Yeah. So that's even harder than this this problem because uh, so that so, so 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 in this case you would say yeah uh, you, what, what you're saying is correct. Here's symmetries and conservation laws, does this imply not that the source form is variational, but that there's an equivalent source form, which is variational. And uh, we haven't looked at that at all. Uh, okay, so, so in particular for this, just Munch, well, determinant of Hessian, can, can, can you give the answer? Yeah so, for, for, yeah, so if we just went with this, Uh, uxy squared equals zero, then for sure this satisf this is rotationally invariant. Uh, they, they generate the conservation laws. So this theorem applies, and this indeed is variational. And the Lagrangian is just, you can just multiply this by u. Uh, so if you multiply your equation by u, that will actually be a Lagrangian. Okay, so all these Mange, all these uh, Mange uh, operators, you know, all these Hessian type equations are variational. So Hessian of U equals determinant of UIJ in any dimension. Uh, that that's always a variational operator. So the answer is actually for, for, for multiplier, the answer is actually yes, right? Because yeah, you, yeah, yeah. So and. Uh, and, and, and basically, this question is like, when you look for Lagrangian, do you want it to be global or like, or like, or, or micro local, just defined in a portion of the so, so, for this problem here, for this, for this kind of Noether's theorem, I, we were just interested in doing the local analysis. But, but, but local in jets, not only in XYs. Local in jets, yeah. <coughs> Well, yeah, local in jets, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah, great. Yeah. Uh, I, I have another question. Uh, so, so uh, a, a bit above, you, 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 you were talking about uh, symmetries with compact supports. You don't mean classical symmetries then, because I, I don't know what, what's 
No, so so not classical symmetries, but but I would say the following, uh, and uh, maybe some of the physicists would 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 I would say this uh, as follows: uh, If you have symmetries of delta, which involve arbitrary functions. And you can, and these symmetries can be compactly supported. That's a very strong requirement. I don't know. Well, what... yeah, but it's more or less the same requirement that these, that these, it's more or less the same requirement that these functions uh, are involve all the variables. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's precisely because okay. users okay. have less, less argument. Right. Right. So, so, uh, so somehow symmetries which can be compactly supported, like diffeomorphism and and uh, uh, the gauge transformation and Maxwell's okay. equations and so on. These are sort of what I would call this. This is what I would really call a gauge transformation. And maybe maybe some of the physicists here can uh, argue with that. But the ones that I know about all all are. Uh, uh, all can be compactly supported. And I would say those are the ones that will give you differential identities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, that raises an interesting question, by, by the way. Uh, uh, can we write down, can we enumerate, can we classify differential equations which admit compactly supported solutions uh, or differential systems. So example, jet space, the, the contact system, of course, just the contact ideal viewed as a differential system. So theta alpha, theta alpha i, there's your jet space. Uh, of course, the jet space admits compactly supported solutions. You just pick u to be compact and differentiate it. And then you'll have a solution to the contact system, which is compactly supported. Does that characterize jet space? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Does that characterize the contact ideal? Maybe, maybe not. No, 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 no. Let's take the following. I mean, the wave equation. So I think is I think this question is somehow related to Darboux integrability. No, 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 no. Let's just take a different word to the group uh, and lift it somehow. Uh, to, right. to bundle, right, and prolong, and then take differential and variant, and so, and, and you have lots of such equations, right? Yeah. Well, oh, just take some differential invariants. Yeah. And, yeah. And that, your group is huge. You definitely can. Uh, but no, I want. But uh, yeah. So something's got to be invariant under the full diffeomorphism group. Well. well or, 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 or Cartan primitive, right? Like simple exomorphism group and do the same. Yeah. Okay. Well, no, doesn't seem to be. Uh, we talk about this more. Okay, yeah, yeah. Maybe. Okay. Right. Other, other questions or comments for uh, for Ian? Uh, uh, some, some, something. Okay, May I, Christian. Mm -hmm. Yes. Good please. afternoon or good morning or whatever, Doro. <laughs> yes. So, so uh, as the uh, so-called. Uh, Gaurav theory of differential equations, uh, from your point of view, can you say, uh, what can you say from your point of view? About? How to the Gaurav theory, Gaurav theory. Gawa theory. Yes, for differential equations, okay, in general. Wow. From, yeah, but the uh, uh. uh, symmetry and uh, yeah yeah i i have to say that's uh, on my list of things to yeah you know there's this galois theory of linear odes right yeah yeah but not only uh, ode but uh, so some kind of uh, integration problems and uh, some symmetries and yeah uh, so so uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Do you have some, uh, yes, uh, some uh, approach from your point of view? Yeah, so so this is from for me a, a, a tough thing to answer. So there's so there's um, so there's symmetries 
of, of DEs and certainly out of Ali, uh, you, you have integration methods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they break into to two kinds, uh, mm -hmm. special group invariant solutions and then, and then kind of reduction for, mm -hmm. for general solutions. But then you have this whole Vesio mm -hmm. Picard mm -hmm. theory. And this, this is what I think people would usually call Galois theory of, of differential equations. And for me, my understanding is that this theory is the following. Can you find solutions in a given differential ring? Mm -hmm. Right? Can you find can you find solutions which only involve some special functions and so on? So, mm -hmm. and quantum read, huh? Quantum, yeah, right, right. Quantum Qual possibility. Yeah, quantum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So somehow, somehow mm -hmm. these two these two subjects don't seem to talk to each other very much. Is in in the sense that I don't I know. Quite a bit about this business. I know some things about this business, but I don't understand. Don't I don't know very much about this this Galois theory. Okay, so so of course, uh, for uh, the, in the general sense of uh, ordinary differential equation, is some uh, yes, some uh, formulations. So that kind of study can be uh, done. Okay, but uh, yeah. As uh, the, uh, so not only the so uh, ODE but for any kind of partial differential equations, okay, the symmetry, the existence of symmetry, that it gives some uh, express meaning. So for some kind of uh, integrations. Uh, yeah. So so uh, so the the. the the thing that people know the best is if, if if G is a symmetry group mm -hmm. of some system of equations, then mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. you can look for mm -hmm. G invariant solutions. Oh, 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 okay, oh, and oh. and typically. And so if, if G is sort of co-dimension one mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. on, on M, then mm -hmm. that will reduce this system of differential equations to ODEs, uh -huh. Uh -huh. okay? Mm -hmm. And so uh, this, this, is a, this is the, mm -hmm. I don't think it's an understatement to say, this is the most powerful technique available for integrating mm -hmm partial differential equations. So for example, in general theory of relativity, it's pretty hard to, to find, so, except for some solutions coming from, al al which are algebraically special, it's pretty hard to write down solutions to the Einstein equations, which don't have symmetries, which aren't obtained by, by uh, using um, uh, uh, th this process of symmetry reduction to ordinary differential equations. If you're studying minimal surfaces, uh, mm -hmm. the, the equations, the minimal surfaces that are in some sense well understood or best understood are ones with lots of symmetries. And again, it's by reduction of the minimal surface equation to the ODEs. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. okay. okay, so uh, yeah, I'll just leave it at, 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 at that. So we have, a, I have a paper with Mark Felds and Mm -hmm. and Charles Torrey on this, mm -hmm. but it, you can look in Peter Oliver's book mm -hmm. and okay. that's got a, a fairly good discussion of, of how you use uh, symmetry groups to reduce the ODEs, but he, he made a little mistake, mm -hmm. mistake there. He assumed that a certain transversality condition holds, but you don't need, you don't need that transversality condition to do this symmetry reduction. So, uh, so I would say that symmetry, if you have symmetries, you can use them to find mm -hmm. in group invariant solutions. So solutions oh. with symmetry, and, and that's pretty much well understood. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty much the best way that you have for solving mm -hmm. equations. I don't know 
too much about Vessio, Picard, or Cochrane uh, theory for, for PDEs. Usually, I think most of that stuff was done for ODEs, mm -hmm. although maybe the theory has been worked out for PDEs too. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 